Okay, so uh, hello again. So I think uh, today my last lecture is going to be about um, two different topics. So the I didn't finish what I wanted to say in the last lecture, so there was a lot of ground to cover. So I will continue a bit with that, and then I'll move to the third lecture that is basically about uh, maybe more traditional light matter interfaces that are um, nanophotonic uh, interfaces, and I'll talk about collective effects in these situations. Okay, so actually now when I came, I was talking with uh, uh, someone that said that basically this debate about uh, subradiance or superradiance being classical or quantum is a quite old debate, but it seems that it uh, resurfaces uh, periodically. Uh, and so we were, the last uh, question that I asked you yesterday was whether we had uh, people that thought that uh, subradiance, also I'm happy to talk about superradiance, I mean I'm a subradiance person, but uh, I think the debate applies also to superradiance, whether, whether it is classical or quantum and uh, nobody really talked much, but um, uh, my point of view is that in general, if uh, all the uh, slides that I showed you uh, in the previous day, um, if I change the word atom by classical dipole, the physics, physics is exactly the same. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna talk about a couple of situations where this is not the case. So this is a, a talk on quantum optics, so I wanted to actually talk about something quantum. And so just before I proceed, I just wanted to uh, very briefly review some of the concepts that we were discussing. So we are talking about a chain, 1D chain of atoms that are separated by a uh, distance that is uh, smaller than the resonance wavelength over two. So this is where subradiant uh, states appear. Uh, I'm finding the eigenstates of a Hamiltonian that is the non Hermitian Hamiltonian that uh, is written like this, mu zero square omega zero square sum over all atoms, ij, p dot, <coughs> range function, ri, rj, omega zero, p. And here I have the operators. Okay, so this is uh, for a chain in free space. So this is the vacuum Green's function that we mentioned yesterday and that also Antoine has mentioned several times, the BDD in his case. It is projected over the uh, dipole uh, uh, moments of the atom. Okay, so it's, uh, for instance, in the most uh, toy model version, you can think of atoms that are either polarized like this or like this, okay? I'll actually talk about the more physical situation that is atoms that have multi-level structure, hyperfine structure in later in the talk. Okay, so I have this uh, Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian conserves the number of excitations. And so I can diagonalize it by blocks and I can look at the case of one excitation. So basically my basis is the first atom is in the excited state and all the others are in the ground or the second is in the excited state and all the others are in the ground, or basically the last one is in the excited state and all the others are in the ground. And so I can write this Hamiltonian in this basis as a matrix, and it's an n by n matrix. And I can diagonalize this matrix, okay? And this uh, is going to give me some eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors are collective modes. So they tell me about the spatial structure of the, uh, basically of the phases of these dipoles. So it can be like all plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, many combinations. And the eigenvalues tell me about the frequency shift relative to the bare resonance frequency and about the uh, decay rate. So if uh, this gamma psi is larger than gamma zero, the single atom decay rate, the spontaneous emission rate, this is the super radiant mode. <coughs> and if that's not the case, we find sub-radiant modes. 
Okay. Um, I actually think I need more than four. Sorry, I told you. <laughs> okay, and so I also mentioned that we can associate these um, these states with uh, guided modes of an infinite chain. So let me change this. So uh, if now I have uh, an infinite uh, chain, then I can find eigenstates that look like this, as spin weights that act on my ground state, that is a product state of all the atoms in the ground state. I act on this spin weight with this spin weight that looks like this. So some uh, pj coefficients sigma is this j acting on my ground state and so when this is a infinite uh, chain this is just simply e to the i k c j sigma is this j mm -hmm. okay so I'm applying an uh, excitation with a well-defined k vector along the c direction this, is this creates an excitation on this uh, ground state <coughs> and then I mentioned that I can uh, connect this wave vector to whether the this spin wave is dark or bright okay so I can write Omega as a function of K and I can write K <coughs> and then there is such a thing <laughs> called the light cone so it's, it's actually something that is tilted like this, typically. So this is omega equals ck. But because my um, these modes appear in a very narrow region, because these uh, basically the modes have the bandwidth uh, that I have is going to be around gamma zero, then these modes are going to see a very small region of the light cone. So I'm just going to plot it as a vertical line. Okay, so it's actually this area here. And this is K0, that is omega 0 over C. Okay, so all this region here corresponds to photon that propagates in free space. This region here doesn't. And I have here the edge of my brilliant zone, pi over D. And then I can plot the dispersion relation, and it looks something like this, whatever and it is centered around omega zero, the resonance frequency of the atoms. So whenever k is larger than k zero, so this region here, all these modes are subradial. Or, as I mentioned before, they are guided. Okay, so this is important to for what I'm gonna say uh, in a minute. So this is the classical physics, but what do we learn about this? If we want to prepare a subradiant excitation, or what is a subradiant excitation? It's something that is, has a wave vector that lies beyond the light line, and also it has to be <coughs> smooth, spatially, okay? So if I plot the amplitude of this <coughs> excitation, it has to be something smooth. It cannot have <coughs> very sharp features. Why is this the case? Somebody know? Why cannot I have something that is like? Well. Ah? No. It could be symmetric, but a spike. It's because if you take the Fourier transform of this, this has wave vectors all over the place. So you want something that is smooth, such that it is very localized around that given <coughs> case, something that doesn't have a lot of a spread. So it has to be smooth, soft, okay? So this is the physics of subradiant modes, if you want, in k-space. And so now I'm gonna talk to you about the physics. This is single excitation, so what happens when you have more than one excitation?
Okay, so then I want to talk just a bit about uh, two excitations. So that's why I was writing this before. So I just explained if we have one excitation, I can write it as a spin wave that has certain coefficients uh, that are associated with a given weight vector actually. And we know that for a finite chain, this excitation decays as one over n cubed, okay? So the longer you make the chain, the darkest this uh, state becomes. Then one can think of, you know, I mean, these are many body problems, so you can say what happens when you put two excitations. So naively, I'm gonna go and try to apply this spin excitation twice. So when I do that, I get something that I can write as Cij, where I have atom I excited, atom J excited, and all the others are in the ground state, okay? Mathematically, this is always true. And I can check if this is an eigenstate of my Hamiltonian. And the answer is that this is not the case. So, uh, I and if I plot Cij, it looks like this. So this is for atom I equals one to atom I equals N, atom I equals one to atom I equals N. And if you look at it, it has a very <coughs> deep cut whenever I equals to J. Why this is the case? Because <coughs> an atom is really a two-level system. You cannot put two excitations on a two-level system. So this is very non-classical. This is very unharmonic. So if you think of uh, harmonic oscillators, these physics <coughs> will not appear there. So that's why I'm calling this quantum. So because the spins are not bosons, you can demonstrate very easily that this is not an eigenstate and actually decays quite poorly. I mean, you can always calculate the life, lifetime of such an excitation. And we find that this, uh, the decay rate scales as one over N, not as one over N cubed. This is still dark, but it's poorly dark and also it's not an eigenstate. <coughs> and so, okay, what can you do? Instead of doing this, you can just take the Hamiltonian, look at the two excitation subspace and you can diagonalize. And this is what you find. So you find again, and now an eigenstate written as Cij. And here, this is what happens. So this is uh, an excitation that has basically no population in the diagonal when i equals j. And it has a maxima here. And it's uh, very smooth. And in this case, we found that it decays as one over uh, n half to the cube. So what happens here is the following. If you have a chain of atoms and you look at the two body subradiant state, what happens is that half of the chain, let's say, is, in, uh, is uh, um, using, the state is using half of the chain to store an excitation if you want, and half of the chain to store the other excitation. And that's why the scales as one over n halves to the cube. More than that, we have found that these excitations obey a Fermi um, or a Pauli exclusion principle in space. So basically, uh, they have some anti-symmetrization in the wave function, okay? And no longer uh, more than this, I have told you before, let me see, maybe I can, I can erase this. I've told you before that subradiant states, they look like, or let me call this one, one, and I will explain this. They are written as this. So this is the most subradiant eigenstate in the single excitation manifold. I can write the second most subradiant. I can order all the eigenstates according to how fast they decay, right? And I can write it as this. So these coefficients will be slightly different. And what I'm telling you when I say that they, <coughs> these states fermionize is when I look at the most subradiant eigenstate in the two excitation manifold, I can write it as some ij C i one, C j two, minus C j one, C i two, E i, E j. So I pick basically the wave functions of the two most subradiant eigenstates and I fermionize it. And this is how I find a very good ansatz 
for this space. So on the other hand, if you ask me whether these things are fermions, I would say that there is no real difference between a fermion and a hardcore boson in 1D. So I cannot call them fermions in reality. And so this holds, of course, um, not just for two excitations, but for many excitations, as long as the number of excitations is dilute. So why this has to be the case? Imagine that I flip all my atoms. What is the subradiant state there? <coughs> there is no subradiant state. So the dimension in this, uh, you know, e uh, all excited manifold is again one, is all the atoms are excited, and this is by definition a superradiant state. So it decays <coughs> very fast. So if I start putting more and more excitations, these excitations want to repel each other, they want to be smooth. If you start packing excitations in the chain, eventually they cannot fulfill their nature, and then the excitations are not going to be, they are not going to be like fermions. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, you know, subradiance <coughs> as a very quantum creature that I, as far as I know, in a set of harmonic oscillators, you cannot observe this physics. If you have any questions, this is the moment because I'm going to change topic. Yes? Yes. <laughs> so you have a, s if you want subradiant states, the problem is that they, because there's like a kind of electron hole symmetry, yeah. the problem is that they are not very subradiant. Yeah. 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 So the most subradiant eigenstates are always in the low excitation manifold. They, mm -hmm. When you start uh, piling up, typically at least, uh, that is not the case. Maybe with disorder, what I'm saying is not true. It might be that some disorder realization uh, I mean, I know because I've looked at this, so I mean, don't quote me on this, but uh, I think when I've done calculations and I have added disorder, there has been cases where I have found that the two excitation subradiant state is darker than any subradiant state in the single excitation one. So it may happen, but uh, I don't even know why this disorder happened. Disorder in the position. Uh, disorder in the position, yes. <laughs> uh, I have tried this for not for atoms in free space, but for atoms coupled to a 1D line, yeah. Okay, any other question? Yes. In the physical picture, why would you have a permeation of this, of the state function? Um, so I know it has to be a smooth, so I know that it has to have, so I know that it has to have a K that lies beyond the light line, these states, or two Ks if you want. I know that it has to be a smooth, and I know that they have to repel each other because, again, of this uh, two-level um, nature of the atoms. So if they have to repel each other and they have to be smooth at the same time, they have to be physically separated, if you want. And so the most obvious way is to have, like, this kind of a structure. Why? I mean, it cannot be plus. It has to be minus to to precisely avoid the case of putting two excitations in one atom. But I don't have a better intuition than that. Just saying that in some sense, something that is very local, that is the fact that atoms are truly two-level systems, through these long-range correlations, it percolates to these uh, very extended states, making them behave in a very <laughs> quantum manner. Any other question? Yes. Yes. Can you show where on this can you plot in which direction? Oh yeah. The sure. <laughs> so it's they are in both. <laughs> so uh, these are these coefficients. Uh, let me maybe write it in the blackboard, maybe it's easier. So I have generically if I have uh, a state in the two excitation subspace, any state I have, I can write as sum over I J C I J E I E J product, all the other atoms are in the ground state, minus two. So how is that? I can generically write an excitation as all the atoms are in the ground state, except <laughs> the two that are excited, that are I and J. And I have to sum over all I and J with some coefficients that they are given to me when I diagonalize. And so how do I plot this C I J? So now it's a 2D kind of plot. 
So before I had just some i, c, i, p, i, right? And then <coughs> this is the case of uh, one excitation. So I can, I can make a plot of the c's versus c. And so it, it will do like something like that. But now I cannot do this thing because I have to plot along i and along j. So now it becomes a 2D plot, i, j, and now it's a density plot. So this is for atom one to atom n. This is for atom one to atom n. And what I'm saying is that in the diagonal there is no excitation, and then the excitation looks here. That's it. Or more questions? That's it. Okay. Good. So then I'm going to talk about another possibility <coughs> uh, that is about, again, like collective effects that you cannot find in a system that is classical. So I have said already that it's not my belief, it's a whole truth. I mean, people have been doing this in antennas for 60 years that if you have classical dipoles in an array, this system guides light. But what if now in my array of dipoles, I put, I mean, I can consider, for instance, a high index dielectric sphere, so they support dipole modes. And I can tweak the refractive index of some of my spheres to make it different. So this is a defect in my waveguide, which means that when light propagates, it's gonna see this defect and it's gonna be scattered away. So defects are bad in general to guide light. But what if now we have a system of now atoms that instead of having just one ground state, they have two ground states. So for instance, zero and one. And because of selection rules, this is a very, I mean, I don't think this case is a natural case. This cannot happen in nature, but just for the sake of uh, making a plot and explain this. Uh, imagine that you have this system where you have zero and one, two ground states, connected to an excited state, and these uh, transitions are associated <coughs> to different polarizations, sigma plus and sigma minus, okay? so. Imagine that I have initially all my atoms in zero, except a couple of them in one. And then I propagate with light that is sigma plus polarized. So when I'm propagating, or when light is propagating, it's gonna suddenly see an atom in the wrong ground state, and this is gonna scatter light all over the place. So again, it's the same idea of you know, having a defect as being bad for guiding light. But again, atoms are quantum objects. <coughs> so you could think of uh, maybe this is not gonna be the case because there might be entanglement. And then this picture that is a very classical picture is not gonna apply for our atoms. And so we may have <coughs> subradiant states that guide light even in the presence of several ground states. Okay? So I wanted to just show uh, paper by the group of uh, Helmut Ritz uh, that actually is about this precise uh, um, question. So what happens when you have multiple ground states and one excited state? And so he found that actually there is a radiance by entanglement in this system. Uh, but my only concern in this paper is that it's a very nice paper, but it's somehow a paper about uh, treating the problem as DQD for the collection of atoms. So he considers that all the atoms are in the same spatial location. So it's a very symmetric problem. The Klebs gordant are all uh, the same. The dipole moments are all the same. So it's a very simplified picture. And then it's not clear because all these uh, phenomena are about interference. It's not clear that this picture is gonna survive in actual arrays such as the one that Antoine did. <laughs> So we can take a look on why the case of hyperfine structure, that is something that naturally occurs in most atoms, break down this simple toy model of, uh, that I have been explaining in the past lecture. So first of all, photon polarization is not uniform in space, okay? So if I have, for instance, this atom here in this 1D chain, I apply a magnetic field in this direction, such as the quantization axis aligns with the direction of the chain. <coughs> and then my atom decays to the ground state and it emits a sigma minus photon. 
okay, that is the, for this transition is what, uh, uh, basically what is allowed because of uh, symmetry and selection rules. Along this direction, the polarization is preserved, sigma minus, so it will hit this other atom that is in the ground state and it will go up and it will decay. So along this direction, everything is good. So it's really like two level physics. However, if we have an atom somewhere else, <coughs> such as for instance, if we have a 2D array, this is not true. So when the photons propagate, they change the polarization. So by the time that the photon arrives here, it may have some sigma plus component, okay? So then this is no longer two level physics. It's something more complicated. The other um, situation that is, uh, I mean, if we would just have this problem, then I would say just work with, you know, with 1D chains and we're done. But there is another problem. That is, what if now my atom is not in one of these so-called stretch states that are these extra states that appear mostly on the sides that maximize angular momentum? <coughs> it's somewhere in the middle, for instance. When it decays, it's gonna indeed emit a sigma minus photon. Doo -doo 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 -doo. But if this atom is now here, it's gonna pick this sigma minus photon, it's gonna go up, and when it decays, it may decay back here, which is again like two level physics, <coughs> two level atom physics, or it may decay here. And then again, <coughs> it's broken. Our toy model doesn't work anymore. So it's clear that this is a problem. And then I'm gonna talk about why this is actually a very complicated problem. So why this is a complicated problem? Here we have our effective Hamiltonian for two level atoms, which this Jij and gamma Ij, you can write them as Green's <coughs> functions. So this is the effective Hamiltonian that I wrote before, but I erased. Okay. Multi-level atoms. You can write a model like I did yesterday, but it's it looks much worse. I mean, here I have to sum over polarization indices, so now suddenly I have two extra sums. And my operators now also look more complicated. There are Klebs Gordon coefficients all over the place that enforce selection rules. But this is not just more complicated because I have to sum over more indices. The actual complexity of the problem comes from here. If I have two level systems, I have just one unique ground state. It's all the atoms in the ground state. Easy, the dimension of the Hilbert space is one. If I have two ground states, suddenly I have a degenerate ground state manifold, the dimension is two to the n already without even having a single excitation in the system, I have a Hilbert space that grows exponentially. So then that's a problem. And just to check, I can write very easily the ground state of four atoms, is all the atoms in the ground state. When I have two uh, ground states, this is no longer the case. So hyperfine structure is gonna totally mess up interference. And so super radiance and sub radiance and everything is gonna be affected. Okay, so just uh, I know that I can basically, uh, for a 1D chain I have extra symmetries and I can classify the kind of states that I can have according to angular momentum projection. And so it becomes a bit complicated, but the summary is that when I start lowering the angular momentum projection that is basically occupying sites that are on this side, of the atom, so here, here, here. I'm gonna start to have a multiplicity of possibilities of putting atoms in different levels, and I have to classify these two, and I can find states that are very classical. So we found this numerically, so you can look at the uh, manifold where you just have one state in, one atom in the wrong state, and you can diagonalize this manifold, and what you're gonna find is that this defect is gonna locate itself in the edges of the chain, <coughs> and the rest of the chain is gonna do two level subradiance. So again, what do we know about subradiant states? They like to be smooth, and they want to occupy the most they can, right? Because the chain is more, um, the state is more and more subradiant when you increase the atom number. So what is the best that a chain or a state can do? Take all the atoms except one and prepare itself in the same state as if it would be 
a two-level atom system and push the defect away. And this is exactly what happens. So this is why the defect is located in the edges. So this is somehow a bit disappointing because I have promised you that when you have multiple ground states, the system is really quantum, right? Uh, but this is very classical. It's like I've just added a defect on the side. So boring. I mean, I worked a lot and then I found this, so. Okay, but at least we can understand. There is, however, another surprise. We also found other states. These states are very complicated states and I'm not gonna describe them, but uh, we can write an ansatz for them. Um, the important thing here is that indeed I can, I can write them as some excitation that has an associated wave vector that is beyond the light cone. And they involve all the excited states, so two, three, four, five. And then here I have very complicated entangled structure in the ground state. So these are very highly entangled states. We have checked that they are subradiant. They decay as one over n cube. <laughs> and we can even calculate the field that they radiate. So it looks similar to before. Just that now, if this is 14 atoms, actually I'm considering a dimension that is, I don't know, like a million states. So instead of having 14 before for a matrix, now I have a million. So it's very complicated. And it's so complicated that we don't even know how to access them. And we don't know how to engineer them. So my uh, only comment if you're an experimentalist is beware of hyperfine structures. Apply magnetic fields whenever <laughs> you can. And maybe there is some exotic phenomena, but uh, I don't think even the theorists right now know what happens in this situation. But it's a very quantum situation. I haven't uh, found anything. I don't have any kind of uh, insight of any classical system where this could happen, where you have very, I don't know, very entangled uh, subradiant states. Okay, so this is another example. So it looks like it's a very rich problem, but it's also a very complicated problem. Okay, so now, again, more questions, because now I'm really, really changing topic. No? Okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna start with my third lecture. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, <laughs> and so what I'm going to talk about uh, in this lecture is about um, atom-atom interactions in non-conventional bats. So, so far in the first lecture, I introduced uh, basically a SP model to describe atom, atom interactions in a generic uh, dielectric medium. Then I've talked to about a case where uh, I've taken the easiest dielectric medium that one can think of, that is vacuum. And now I'm gonna talk about something more sophisticated. So just a brief uh, review of what I mentioned the first day of class. Uh, people have been trying to uh, enhance atom-light interactions for decades. So there has been, of course, amazing work in cavity QED, where you place an atom in a cavity in between two mirrors. And more recently also in waveguide QED, where you place an atom close to a one-dimensional bath. And I mentioned uh, the first day that how efficient is the light matter coupling between the photon that propagates in this waveguide, for instance, and this atom is given by this figure of merit, that is a ratio between the decay rate into the 1D channel and the emission into free space. And I haven't called this gamma zero because this is a modified free space, okay? So <laughs> you can think of this as free space, it should be approximately okay. But in reality, the presence of the nanostructure modifies the modes of vacuum. It's not vacuum anymore, it's like a weird vacuum, so I'm calling it gamma prime, okay? I also mentioned that there are many different kind of uh, structures. So people have been doing fabric pero cavities for many years. More recently, the electric cavities in photonic crystals. Cavities not only work for atoms, they work for other kind of uh, structures such as superconducting qubits. And in waveguide QD, there are recent experiments of atoms placed close to a fiber, close to a photonic crystal, of uh, solid state emitters in waveguides in diamond, and also the same kind of physics apply to, again, transmond, superconducting qubits. So now I wanted to just mention some figures of merit of different systems. So fibers, if you place an atom close to a fiber, this uh, optical depth, the figure of merit, is 0 0.05. 
So it's kind of bad. I mean, it's a great work. You have to suffer a lot, but you still don't get a very strong interaction. So this means that basically if you send a photon through the fiber, most of it, I mean, either won't interact or it will be uh, scattered into free space. So that's not very good. You can do, um, change your nanostructure a bit. And um, this is a photonic crystal, a picture of a photonic crystal. And in this photonic crystal, this uh, gamma 1D over gamma prime has been, of around one, has been achieved experimentally. So of course, in theory, you can get 200, but in practice, I think this is around the best that people have done. Could be a bit higher. Uh, other kind of systems that have been explored are not just atoms, also quantum dots <coughs> in photonic crystals. So I think this is a picture of the group of Peter Loda. And here, gamma 1 over gamma prime is 10 or larger. So this uh, starts to look quite good. So <coughs> basically, the quantum dots will interact efficiently with the <laughs> guiding modes of this nanostructure. And then the people working in superconducting qubits come and then destroy all the people <laughs> working in atomic physics <laughs> because they get a gamma 1D over gamma prime of uh, 100. So actually this is uh, work of the group of Oscar Painter and I think the actual gamma 1D over gamma prime is over 150. <laughs> so that's pretty impressive. They have other issues but so. They are not real photos. <coughs> they are not real photos. Yeah, I mean, they are not very unharmonic, you could say, or... I mean, they are real photons, yes. You could say they have to cool them down a lot. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, but this is why they are, they are working. Yeah. Optical, yeah, okay, so 400 nanometer to 800, or you would consider telecom also optical, or...? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, not real systems have <laughs> achieved, uh, or not real photos have achieved uh, these very high figures of merit. Uh, and so this is not only, you could say that I'm claiming that the good thing of uh, doing um, physics with nanostructures is that you can enhance your coupling between light <laughs> and the atoms because basically you're confining light into a uh, 1D, and so you can do whatever you could do in free space, but just better. But this is not true. Nanophotonics uh, or nanophotonic interfaces allow for many more uh, uh, different physical effects to emerge. So here I just wanted to show a bit of, uh, you know, actual work and ideas uh, about, you know, atoms close to other kind of photonic structures. So if you're interested, you can take a look at this uh, review paper, recent review paper. And so some ideas are, for instance, uh, trapping atoms close to 2D photonic crystals. In this case, you can use the actual periodicity of the crystal to produce a trapping potential. So there is also Casimir forces that you would not have in vacuum that appear when you put atoms close to nanostructures and they will help you trap these atoms in large sheets. Uh, and then of course the interactions, when I talked about this gamma 1D, this becomes now a more complicated interaction in 2D. So you can start thinking about maybe realizing spin models, uh, like I guess you will talk about soon, like in your next lecture, but with uh, photonic crystals in 2D. Uh, recently also there is an idea on uh, preparing uh, topological edge modes in uh, uh, for atoms that are coupled to 2D photonic crystals. Um, other possibilities involve um, coupling to other degrees of freedom. So this is uh, uh, work from the group of, of Oscar Painter, and in this uh, work they just demonstrate optomechanical coupling between photons and phonons. So you could start thinking along these lines. And then a very uh, kind of hot topic right now in quantum optics is chiral quantum optics. <laughs> so basically, if you have a nanophotonic structure, um, this provides a non-trivial near field, and this near field has some polarization that provides helicity. And so if you have emitters that couple to this guided mode, for instance, this is a 2D photonic crystal where that has holes. And in a line, they have removed the holes or they have split the holes apart. And so basically it's a defect that guides light. Light is confined. It cannot escape in these directions because of the, these holes here. <laughs> so then if you put an emitter in this waveguide or effective waveguide, 
and in sigma plus polarized, it will emit only in this direction. It will not be bidirectional, okay? And if now it's sigma minus, it will emit in just the other direction. And so you can start thinking in doing cascaded systems, and there are ideas about doing, I don't know, like uh, even quantum computers using these kind of ideas of Carroll quantum optics. So a lot of things can happen. So there is this is a very active field of research. And so somebody asked me how to trap atoms close to photonic crystals, and I'm gonna talk to you about my favorite kind of nanostructure, just because I was doing my postdoc on this, that are photonic crystals, as an example of which kind of physics you can uh, observe that is not uh, conventional, that you won't have, for instance, in a cavity or in free space. So let me explain a bit what a photonic crystal is. So if we have a fiber, this fiber has a refractive index, N, that is larger than that of vacuum. That's why fibers guide, okay? So light, because of total internal reflection, cannot escape. It's very similar to this idea of subradiant modes as being guided modes because they lie beyond the light line. If you have a fiber, it will be you'll have the dispersion relation looks like this. Omega K. This is vacuum. And then the material that this fiber is made of has a refractive index that is like this, uh, that sets this other light line. And so the guided mode of the fiber will be something that lies here. Okay, so it cannot radiate in this region. It has to be confined, and so that's how a uh, fiber guides. Then you can think of putting a hole in your fiber, and then this, uh, what is gonna happen is that when light propagates, it's gonna see this hole and it's gonna scatter. Okay, so this is a problem. But what you can do is instead of putting just a hole, you can put a periodic array of defects. And what happens is that this creates a band structure. So, uh, a band gap, sorry. So if this is the dispersion relation, now there is a Brillouin zone. So A is the distance between the holes. And this opens a band gap in your uh, dispersion relation. So light can only propagate in these <coughs> regions, but it cannot propagate in the band gap. And this has a strong uh, effect in the interactions <coughs> of the atoms that you put in the vicinity, because again, the interactions are mediated by photons. You change the Green's function, that is what you're doing by doing this, so you change the interactions. And so imagine that we put an atom close to this photonic crystal, and the resonance frequency of the atom lies in one of the bands. So if that's the case, when this atom is excited, it's gonna decay, it decays into this waveguide, and the photon, because there is a guided mode there, can propagate, and it's gonna be emitted. So there is gonna be decay, right? The photon is gonna escape. What if now we place the atom, and we modify the dielectric structure such that now the resonance frequency of the atom lies in the band gap. Then we excite from above our atom, and the atom then cannot decay into the band gap, because there are no modes. It's for it, for the atom, it cannot leak. So what happens is that now this photon is gonna be localized around <laughs> the atom, and it's like uh, now the atom is carrying its own cavity. And now you could put another atom, and then you can basically engineer <laughs> coherent interactions between atoms, and you can tune the range of interaction by modifying how far the resonance frequency is from the band gap. So if it is very deep into the band gap, the cloud of photon, the photonic cloud is very confined. If it is very close to the bandage, then it's, uh, it spreads, right? So that makes sense. Okay, and if you want uh, references, they are here. And so this is a bit of the theory. Now I want to show you a bit of the experiment. So I'm a theorist, so the only thing I can understand in a lab is this, the vacuum chamber. I mean, I don't understand it, but at least I can recognize it, which is more than what I can do about all the other stuff. And so this is the vacuum chamber of the experiment of uh, the group of Jeff Kimmel at Caltech. And inside this vacuum chamber, you have what is called the chip. And so in this chip, there is a window, and there are here a bunch of photonic crystals. 
hanging. So you cannot see them. You may see some white lines, but these are like some um, uh, some rails to guide the photonic crystal, but this is not truly the photonic crystal. This is how you trap atoms close to a photonic crystal. So this is the chip, this is the window. Here we have what is called the alligator photonic crystal. This is photonic crystal. Here you make a mod, you send light, and it's really like, you know, batting. The cloud of atoms fly, and there is here another trap that traps them. So, catches it. So here are the atoms. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm a theorist again, so I mean, that's pretty <laughs> obvious. Uh, I think it's easy, but I think, anyway, I don't think it is <laughs> <laughs> in reality. For me, that's how I explain it. I know there is a lot of work uh, involved in this. Uh, this is a, a detail of how the alligator looks like. So this is uh, fibers that send the light in and out from the photonic crystal. These are the kind of safety rails for the alligators, so they provide mechanical and thermal uh, support. The problem is that the alligator is in a vacuum, so uh, if you send light, it may heat up, and the only possibility for it to radiate is, uh, I mean, the only possibility for the heat to be released is to radiate. And then uh, in this experiment, they provide this uh, tether arrays to help the heat be leaked. And so, if you want a better detail, this is how it looks like. So this is an electron microscope photography of this very long uh, structure. And so it's very long, yeah, okay. <laughs> and of course, fabricating this is very hard. So again, I'm a theorist, I didn't have to go through this, but this is called the graveyard. So these are all the possibilities of destroying alligators that uh, these guys have uh, found. So you can melt them, you can break them, etc. So it's very difficult fabrication work, but they made it happen. And this is a detail on how you trap the, ex the uh, atoms close to the alligator. So this is the alligator is coming like this. And you have light that is reflecting from the alligator. It creates some potential standing wave. And the atoms are gonna be mostly trapped at the location that is closest to the alligator. You send light in, you measure transmission, you can also measure reflection, and the alligators are estimated to be at around 150 nanometers from the surface. Um, this uh, structure is complicated, so you can, to understand the guided modes, you need to do some numerics, so you have to solve Maxwell's equations. You can find things like Green's functions, but you can also find the modes, the frequency, the dispersion relation. There are uh, two polarizations, at least actually, transverse magnetic, transverse electric. This is typical for waveguides. And there is a region, of course, where the P mode has a band gap. That is not a band gap for the PM mode. And then the question that is actually something that I was discussing with Antoine today is that the beautiful thing of actual photons is that uh, photons give you information about what atoms are doing. Oh yeah, questions, yes. Along? Yeah. So ideally, yeah. yes. In reality, no. So, <laughs> I mean, in reality, maybe yes, but not in this experiment. Unfortunately, it was not possible. So, the alligator is like this. And so this cloud is trapped above, but the atoms are free to move along like this. They cannot be trapped like this. So there are possibilities for making this happen. One is using maybe optical tweezers. Then this could be possible. The problem is that if you bring an optical tweezer close to a, a structure like this, the reflection is gonna distort the field of the tweezer. So you may lose the atom. So here you might have the atom trapped in your optical tweezer. You bring it here and the atom is no longer there. So that's uh, one problem. Another possibility is that this uh, structure, as I have said, it has, it's, it's a photonic crystal. This means that it has, the guided modes have certain block periodicity. So if you plot the, if you send light, electric field, and you plot the electric field as a function of position, it will have some modulation, okay? So then using this, you potentially, if you manage to trap the atoms 
not flying above because then you lose contrast, but really inside the gap, you may use this modulation to trap them periodically. Uh, because there are, so there are three atoms on average, we estimate, so it's not really that we can count one, two, three, we estimate that there are three atoms, and there are three only because uh, of many, <laughs> many reasons. So atoms crash into the photonic crystal, um, atoms collide with each other, there are light induced collisions, so there are many possibilities of losing atoms, basically. So this leads to what we consider in average three atoms but it's not something that we see in a steps or they see in a steps. Yes? Which mode? Because Which mode? This mode? This mode? Close to, to what people call topologically protective nowadays is mostly everything, so maybe yes, <laughs> but I would never consider these modes to be topologically protective, no. Also, what does that mean? Topologically protective is that you have transport potentially if you have a 2D system, right? And so these edge modes go like this and there is a defect. And because there is no backscattering, you can, you guide like this the light, right? So I don't know what that means from the perspective of a photonic crystal. I don't know why we call them topologically protective. You could say what, okay, there are other models like in 1D, this SSH model that has edge modes. This edge modes for the SSH model is, this is a complete, uh, I'm going totally, of topic, but this uh, this system that is this dimerized chain, this has topologically protected modes if you want. So this is here some modes, and in the gap, in the gap you have these defect modes. They are topologically protected because they are robust to each other, but they sit here in the edges. Okay, so these are modes inside the gap. These are not uh, you know guided modes of a photonic crystal. More questions? No. Okay. Wow. okay, so what I wanted to say is that um, we can actually do some calculations uh, for these systems and generically any system. We place atoms close to a given nanostructure. We can send light and from the output field measuring transmission, we get information about the kind of interactions that happen between atoms. So. In particular, uh, for instance, in the case of the alligator, you send light, you measure transmission, T0 without atoms, uh, you change the uh, frequency of the light, and you get an spectrum, okay? So in the band gap, there is very little light, so it's 10 to the minus three, and uh, outside the band gap, there is some transmission. <coughs> then you put atoms, and then you put the atoms in the uh, photonic crystal, and you basically move the frequency response of the photonic crystal, which is you shine some light, you thermally, you thermally modify slightly the <coughs> photonic crystal, this shifts the frequency of the band gap, and so you can basically put the resonance frequency of the atom to be exactly on resonance with this first peak, which is actually a cavity. So you look at the transmission, normalized to the transmission without atoms, as a function of the, the tuning, and you see the typical Lorentzian. So this is a, a, a signature that the atoms are there. And the fact that it's a symmetric Lorentzian, I know that what is happening is that there is some dissipative interaction between the atoms. If now I place the atoms in two different regions, so uh, this place from the peak of the cavity what I'm gonna see is very asymmetric spectra. So something very different. And from this asymmetry, I know that there is some dispersive interaction, coherent interaction between the atoms. So already from the shape of the transmission, I can learn things about what the atoms are experiencing. And I can go further, I can go into the band gap, the band edge, and this asymmetry, the total signal decreases, but the asymmetry gets more pronounced. And this is what I would expect because basically inside the band gap, there is again no mode. The only possibility for atoms to interact is to have coherent interactions. There is no photon propagation, no dissipation. And so 
With this, I mean, we can, just from the transmission, we can extract properties of uh, the Green's function, basically, and we can reconstruct the this gamma 1d over gamma prime as a function of frequency. And so what I want to do now is to explain how you do that using the black hole. So before I start, any questions about the previous slides? No? OK. So my aim now is I'm going to just look again at what we did the previous lecture, uh, write the effective Hamiltonian with the Green's function, and then tell you about some details of the physics of 1D. I will go to the Green's function in 1D and explain which kind of phenomena that just uh, in the linear optical regime one can explore. Okay. And try to understand signatures uh, in the optical spectra. Okay, so now we're going to have, let me just depict the system, a 1D channel, and I'm gonna have atoms coupled to this 1D channel, and I'm gonna send light, and I'm gonna look at the transmission of this light, and I want to see what happens in the transmission what I can learn about what the atoms are doing. Okay, so let me just write what I wrote before. So now this <laughs> system is gonna be driven, okay? And so I have a term in the Hamiltonian that tells me about the, uh, the tuning between the laser line and the atoms. Then I have a term that is the coherent interaction, J i j. So this is the real part of the Green's function between atom i and atom j with the dipole-dipole interaction. And then I have, oh, okay. And then I have the term that tells me about the Rabi frequency, the driving. So I have, um, dipole times, uh, sorry, let me call this P, P dot E at position RI, <coughs> sigma GE, I plus P asterisk dot E plus, this is E minus, <coughs> so let me try to put it high at position ri, sigma eg i. So this is the drive term, this is the interaction, and this is also associated with the drive, this is the tuning. Then I also have the Lindblad operator. So just to write it here, <coughs> rho dot is minus i over h bar, h rho plus l rho. Okay, so this is uh, what I explained yesterday. This is how the density matrix of the atoms <coughs> evolves. <laughs> so I have integrated out the field, and that's why I have here the Green's function. And then this part here is gamma ij over 2, 2 sigma rho sigma, minus sigma sigma rho, minus rho sigma sigma, and then I have to put all the EGs. And then this is J of IJ. IJ. Okay. So, and also just for the sake of everything, let me just write the chip. So 
So this is the shift between atom I and atom J, the coherent interaction and the dissipative part is two mu zero omega zero squared over eight bar the asterisk imaginary part of G R I of J dot P. Okay, so this is what I wrote the other day, I think. There might be a minus sign, but anyway. Sigma, where are you telling me? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. Yes, yes. So this is GE and this is G. Yeah, good. Okay, so this is generic, and then the question is um, we want to find the equation of motion for the sigma operators. So this is similar to what uh, Antoine did but using the density matrix, okay? So instead of using the Schrodinger picture and look at the evolution of the density matrix, I'm gonna go to Heisenberg picture and look at the evolution of the sigmas, but basically a very similar equation is found. So the physics is the same. Okay, so then let me write, uh, I'm gonna go to the case of linear optics. So single excitation. And single excitation, and which means basically that there is very low saturation. So this is the expectation value of sigma EE, and I'm setting it to zero. So the atoms are mostly in the ground state. So the physics that I'm gonna discuss, again, is gonna be very classical, okay? And this also means that sigma GG is Okay, so uh, just for the sake of notation, sigma EG, the expectation value, I'm gonna change it to sigma EG, no hat, so that I don't have to be writing expectation values all the time. Okay. So now I can write an equation of motion for these sigmas uh, by uh, uh, looking at how they work on either the evolution of the density matrix, or I can go to this picture of the uh, effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which works well in the single excitation manifold, and then I can write down an equation of motion for sigma. And so it's uh, this, sigma dot GE i is i delta plus i gamma prime two sigma GE plus i omega i plus i sum j equals one to n and then here i have e i j minus i gamma i sigma g e and then here i have j or i j And omega is the radius frequency, which is C, C asterisk dot E plus at RI over H bar, where here I'm also using this is equal to expectation. Okay, so let me explain. This is exactly the same equation that Antoine wrote uh, for the density matrix. So this is the evolution of the operator of between the excited and the ground states for atom I, it evolves according to this part here. So there is a term that is associated with the detuning. There is a term that tel tells me about decay. And so this is a decay, and I have an exp specified here. I'm gonna consider that these atoms are interacting just through the waveguide. So to free a space, they decay independently at a rate gamma prime. We know that this is not true if they are close enough to each other, right? But we're gonna assume that they are far away such that the interaction along the waveguide is the only thing that is collective. So then I can write my Green's function basically as a term that takes care of the 1D part and then a term that is the <coughs> proportional to 
the scattering into vacuum, so I'm going to call it zero, and this is delta ij. Okay, so I'm just saying here that scattering into clear space is, uh, is not collective. The only part that is collective is uh, the um, behavior uh, or the um, scattering into the wet sky. Okay. So I want to explain just for a second a bit on photonics and why the interaction may be long range. For a one digit scan. So imagine that we are in this uh, situation and this is for instance a fiber. So as I've said, I have to find the Green's function of this fiber and it's not very trivial. But I'm not going to do the derivation, but I'm going to tell you why this Green's function has to be something of the sort Okay, so this Green's function, I know just by looking at my system calling it a fiber, that the field has to propagate like this something that is not attenuated, that is not scattered away this is the Green's function of a guided mouse. So I'm going to tell you why it has to look like this. So in free space, the Green's function, it was something complicated, and then something like look like e to the i k r i minus r j over r i minus r j. Okay. This is called actually this is the scalar Green's function. So it's not vectorial, just the scalar part. And uh, it's a spherical wave. And then something is acting on it, and so that's why you get this extra term in the parentheses. So in a system that like this one that has cylindrical symmetry, I can expand this expression into something that looks approximately <coughs> like sum over m, so minus infinity to infinity, of e to the i m c i minus c j, integral in k c of e to the i k c c i minus c j, times some Bessel functions <laughs> that are not very important right now. Okay, so given that I have two points in a space, I can expand this, this spherical wave into uh, something that has cylindrical symmetry. This is uh, the azimuthal number, so it uh, keeps track of uh, the phi components of the position. Okay. So this is an angle phi, and it goes like this. And then this is KC, and the important thing is that because I have the only periodicity in the system, when well I have two symmetries, one is that it's translational invariant along the fiber, and the other is that it's also rotational invariant. So this is the cylindrical symmetry, and that's why this looks like this. Okay? So then, and I don't want to erase everything that is on the other blackboard, so I'm going to erase this. This is a very complicated uh, way of telling why the guiding mouse has to be like this. But anyway, so then what I'm I have to do eventually to find this Green's function is I have to do this integral in Kc from minus infinity to infinity of these functions plus other things that I haven't written. So it's a complicated integral. And I can do it. It goes from minus infinity to infinity. And that is from zero. <coughs> One thing I haven't said is in these expressions, k perpendicular is kc squared minus kc squared. Okay? So it's the transverse wave vector that I can relate to 
omega 0 over c and the longitudinal wave vector. And so if when I do this integral, I find that I have to do it in the complex plane, goes from minus infinity to infinity, and the square root, I don't know if you remember, but this has branch cuts, so it's kind of complicated. So I can draw the branch cuts for you, they are somewhere. So when I do the integral, I have to avoid the branch cuts, and I have to close a contour because this thing has poles. And now, that's the, this is the beauty of complex analysis. I look at this integral I have to do. It goes from minus k0 to k0. Anything that has a wave vector that is between minus k0 and k0 has to be something that radiates into free space. This part here tells me about radiation modes, things that are going to contribute to this gamma prime. This is radiation. This is inside the light cone. But, I happen to find poles here and here, somewhere. These poles are the guided modes. So that's why this fiber supports guided modes because in the complex plane, you can find poles. And when you do a complex <coughs> integration of this, you have a very complicated expression that is going to contribute to the rate of decay into the fiber gamma 1d, and then this expression here, kc, because it's a pole, it's a easy thing, it becomes this thing here. So that's why fibers guide, and that's why this is the green function of a fiber, of the guided mode of a fiber. There is another, a lot of mess of that involves the radiative part. So this is why light doesn't decay. And just from the complex analysis, you can see this. This is very good. Okay, so this is a very long speech, just to say <laughs> that when you have atoms close to a fiber, the interaction range of, uh, the range of interaction between atoms is infinite, it doesn't decay. There might be some material absorption, but by geometry, on how the light is guided, the, in principle, absent material absorption, the interaction range is infinite, but it oscillates, okay? So depending on the position of atom I and atom J, I'm gonna have a term for the Green's function that is real, so cosine or sine, and a term that is imaginary, cosine or sine. So depending on the positions, I can make my interactions mostly dissipative, mostly real, okay? Okay, so now, coming back from this detour, we have the uh, expression for the uh, evolution of this operator, written as, again, a term that depends on the detuning, emission into free space, that leads to decay. We have the driving term, that is the Rabi frequency. And then we have a term that depends on the interactions of atom I with all the al other atoms J. Okay? Let's see how much time I have. Not that much time. Okay. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain everything in terms of collective modes. I can take this term and I'm going to call it Gij. And this is a matrix in index Ij. And I can diagonalize this matrix, and this is again like doing what we did in free space. It's going to tell me about collective modes. If I understand the decay rate of certain collective modes, I know if they are super radiant or sub radiant. So I learned some physics about this system. Okay. So then I'm going to write this expression in vectorial manner. So, well, first I'm going to say that in the steady state, I'm going to drive my system with a continuous wave. In the steady state, this is zero. <coughs> and then I have an equation that relates the sigma, which is all this part, with the drive. And I can rewrite it in terms of vectors and matrices. <coughs> so now I have sigma, which is now <coughs> a column vector that tells me about all the sigmas in terms of a matrix inverse of a matrix, and this matrix is related with these terms and the g's, times my omegas, written in vector form, okay? So I'm writing everything in terms of vectors because, and matrices, because then when I diagonalize things, that uh, then it's obvious that I can diagonalize things. And m is delta plus i gamma prime 
over 2, identity matrix, plus <laughs> this matrix little g. So now if I diagonalize this little g, I have basically <coughs> solved the problem because I know that for a given drive that I speci specify, I know how I'm driving all my modes that are given by the diagonalization of little g, and I know how <coughs> all my sigmas behave, all my atoms behave. So let me do that here. So this matrix, little g, is related with the Green's function, of course. And as I've said, it's basically the Hamiltonian again. And as I've said, this is not Hermitian. You can diagonalize a not Hermitian matrix, but there are properties of the collective modes that are not the traditional properties. <coughs> so basically, <laughs> the... Uh, Is a matrix. I can uh, still diagonalize this matrix, even despite it not being permission. It's complex symmetric because, again, this is related with the Green's function and because of in, recipro in reciprocal systems, this Green's function is symmetric. But then the eigenvectors fulfill some condition that is uh, not trivial, which is this. So these modes are not normal. In quantum mechanics, when you diagonalize your Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, the modes are normal, and then they are not, they don't mix with each other. In, so this would be a Hermit Hermitian conjugate. When you have complex symmetric matrices, you can uh, still diagonalize them, but these modes are non-normal. So this is just the transpose, not the conjugate transpose, complex conjugate transpose. So, okay, so, you can still diagonalize it, but the properties are bizarre, and this is because there is dissipation in the system. So this happens, again, not only for atoms in waveguides. This is very generic. Uh, there are many physical properties that people have been found that are surprising, like revivals that can be related with things like having non-normal modes in a system. Okay, so this is just one case that where you can see this. Okay, and so I think I'm going to, I need to, be a bit faster. I can relate my sigmas with these modes, and they are a sum over modes. Omega, xc, and here I have delta plus i gamma prime over two plus the eigenstates, eigenvalues. So I have related again the behavior of my uh, atoms with <laughs> the drive and with the normal modes of my system. So, sorry, the non-normal modes of my system, this V and the eigenvalues. And then the beautiful thing is that from this equation for sigma, I can find the total transmission of my system. So, I can write the transmission as uh, basically, or the field. as the external field plus mu zero omega zero squared sum i this function r r i r i times phi times sigma v e r. So this is the same expression that I wrote the other day. This is at position r. So here is position r. I'm sending external field and I'm measuring the field at position R, far away. So, as you can see, obviously, it depends on what the atoms are doing. But in the steady state, I already have the solution for what the atoms are doing, written like this. Okay? And it's related with the eigenvalues of my Green's function matrix between all the atoms. And so, in <laughs> the end, doing all the algebra, I find an expression that is this.
So the transmission of the system with atoms normalized to the transmission of the system without atoms of my waveguide, for instance, is just given by this expression, which to me it's a very surprising expression. So, so far I don't have, I've never seen this in my life. I know that it happens for 1D systems. I don't know why. So if you ever find an expression like this, please send me an email. I'm going to say why this expression is very bizarre. After a lot of derivation, I have found that sigmas can be written in this way, where I have a sum over the modes in the system. This makes sense. If I have any system that I can describe with collective modes, any observables can be expressed as something that tells me how much I'm exciting a given mode, given by the weight, a spectral weight of this mode. This is very generic. It makes sense. What doesn't make sense is this. Here, I have no information about the eigenvectors. They are gone. And this is not a sum, it's a product. So this, to me, is mind-blowing. I know it happens in 1D. I know it only happens for transmission. I've never seen such a thing for reflection. It's very unique of 1D. It's very unique of transmission. Why it works, I don't know. But then it's very useful because it tells me directly that the transmission is related <coughs> with the eigenvalues of my green function. And from here, I can know whether if I have a system where all the atoms, for instance, are separated by n pi, in this situation, the physics that I find is that of atoms in a cavity, even though this is a waveguide. If I look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, what I find is that I only have one eigenvalue, which is super radiant. <coughs> the atoms are going to collectively emit at a rate <coughs> that is n times gamma 1d. All the other eigenvalues are dark. If I have any other random position between the atoms, this is not true. And from here, I can get information that I can use in the to understand the experiments. So I can <coughs> very briefly show this and finish. Okay, so if I have a collection of atoms in my photonic crystal or any other one-dimensional system, I have told you that there is this magical formula that relates the transmission with the uh, eigenenergies or eigenvalues of the Green's function between all the atoms. And so I have a dispersive part that is this coherent rate related with the real part. And I also have an imaginary part. This is generic. It doesn't have to be a fiber. It can be a photonic <coughs> crystal or something different. In particular, the easiest case that I can think of is one atom. So if I have an atom, this uh, equation reduces to this simple equation. And so here you have the normalized transition versus frequency. And so you, s you find that at the resonant frequency, the transmission drops. And this is because if you have an atom placed close to a fiber, this behaves exactly as a mirror. It will reflect all light at zero, at the tuning zero, except for the fact that some of the light is scattered <coughs> into free space. So if you make your coupling to the fiber very strong, it would reflect all the light. So this is what happens here, where the scattering rate into the fiber is larger. <coughs> So this is the traditional symmetric case where the, light, the uh, line shape is Lorentzian. You can go to a case where you have some energy shift. So this is, for instance, in the close to the bander, inside the banka. In this case, this is the normalized transmission. If the shift is zero, the real part of the Green's function is zero, this produces a dip. If you start to have some shift, this produces a very asymmetric profile. This is exactly what people call fan of resonance. It can be uh, directly <coughs> related with a fan of resonance. It's exactly the same line shape. So already by looking 
and the degree of asymmetry is given by the real part of the Green's function <coughs> divided by the imaginary part. So already by looking at transmission, I already know a lot about the kind of interactions that my atoms uh, are experiencing. Okay, so with this, I could go on, but I think I have to stop because it's time. I just wanted to say that, just have a slide about the future. So I've been telling you in the last lecture that nanophotonics is exciting, and it is exciting, but what I think could be the future is to actually forget a bit about nanophotonics and think about atoms or qubits uh, as being now quantum photonic structures. So they could behave as mirrors, you can do quantum memories with them, in other systems like superconducting qubits, people have already explored the idea of uh, atoms behaving as mirrors. So what you can do is you can put two of those qubit mirrors and put an ancilla <coughs> qubit in the middle. So this is a cavity, but it's a cavity that works thanks to your qubits, thanks to your atoms. And you can see things like gravity oscillations. And so with this, I just wanted to summarize. I think there is a lot of things that one can explore in this uh, uh, playground of collective phenomena in light matter interfaces. There is a lot of things to understand about how to improve quantum information protocols. You can make all the connections you want with uh, photonics. Uh, you can increase complexity as we have discussed, including more excitations or including different, uh, you know, things like grand state, uh, multiple grand states or adding disorder as I guess you will talk about. Um, also other kind of degrees of freedom, so emotional degrees of freedom. And there are a lot of experimental platforms to you know, do fun things with. Okay, so thanks. <laughs>